Good afternoon. Welcome. It's nice to have everybody back for the uh, annual CNN Roundtable. We usually have a chance to focus on the uh, emerging markets of the world. But because what has transpired in the last uh, year, we thought the new energy equation would be more apropos for Davos 2016. I can see a lot of familiar faces into the audience today, some who work in the industry. And I'm sure those who work in oil and gas would like to, what we used to do in our business before we went to digital, hit the rewind button and take the clock back a couple of years. Uh, January of 2014, Brent was trading this week at $107 a barrel. Uh, in Davos 2015, oil was down at 50 and people started to get very panicked. And then Davos 2016, who would think that oil would lead the headlines and bring equity markets lower? And we look at a price of Brent between $28 and $27 a barrel. So one of the big questions, of course, today is how low we go before we find stability. But we've had a perfect storm, if you will, in the last few years, which has hit a full crescendo as we sit down this afternoon. Kind of four key factors of behind this perfect storm. Uh, first and foremost, we've had a change in Saudi Arabian strategy, which I covered at the OPEC meeting uh, in November of 2014, not to be the swing producer of the world, but instead uh, to go for market share and uh, let the best producers survive. Number two, a shale revolution in the United States, adding 5 million barrels a day. Uh, we've seen some of that come off, about 600,000 barrels in the last year. How much more of a correction will we see in 2016? because of 28 to $30 oil. Number three, and we'll hear from a panelist this afternoon, Russia pumping in nearly 11 million barrels a day, going for all out fight for market share, regardless of price. And then what I like to say is the big question mark over the market in 2016, and why we've seen so much dislocation in the equity markets, I believe this week, is the role of China in demand. Many people are overlooking the fact that China uh, imported better than uh, 7 million barrels a day in December. But many are wondering, we're going to see a dramatic slowdown in China in the second half of 2016. You hear the words transparency called out. Are we really growing 6.8, 6.9% in China and what impact that will have on energy? And I don't want to leave out renewables as well because we see investment in renewables in China and elsewhere. And is that finally competing for fossil fuels in the oil and gas market? I don't think we could have pulled together a better panel to be really candid. I'm really, really happy what we were able to do today uh, considering the news that's in the market. We can give a round of applause for each one of our panelists when we bring them up. First, I'm going to call them in the order that we have them lined up here. Let's give a warm welcome to Khaled Al Fale. He's the Minister of Health and the Chairman of Saudi Aramco. It's nice to have him here. Uh, a very familiar face to the Davos community, Daniel Jurgen, Vice Chair of IHS, the author of The Quest, and also the seminal book that I read, Understanding Energy, The Prize, Daniel Jurgen. His Excellency, the President of Azerbaijan, Ilyam Aliyev, joining us here on center stage. <laughs> Dr. Emmanuel Kachuku, the Minister of State for Petroleum for Nigeria, and uh, the exiting rotating president of uh, OPEC as well. <laughs> A familiar face to the Emerging Markets Roundtable for CNN and back on energy, his specialty. A professor Lin Bojang, the Dean of the Institute for Studies in Energy Policy at Xiamen University in China, of course. <laughs> and Kirill Dmitriev, the Chief Executive Officer of the Russia Direct Investment Fund, a $10 billion fund which is now worth $25 billion even in a down market. Lots of attention and warm regard. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. So what is going on with oil? Good <laughs> <The> question. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Let's start with uh, His Excellency the President. If I was going to ask you that we'd be testing $27 a barrel for the benchmark Brent, uh, you probably would have thought I would, uh, was drinking the wrong stuff and not water uh, or a tea this afternoon. Uh, tell us the surprise you have at the price that we're seeing today, and how do you plan for the future if prices are going to be going even lower than we see today, Mr. President? Well, it's difficult to expect the price going lower, but uh, having this situation today, we will not be surprised if it happens. Of course, we were not prepared for that. We in Azerbaijan were preparing ourselves for so-called post-oil era in about 20 years from now. Therefore, for us, it was a surprise. And at the same time, it was a stress for our economy because we already planned our budget at the level of uh, $50 this year 
and $90 last year. So we had to cut our expenses, our investments, and uh, keep the social package in place. Uh, our economy is stable and sustainable. We have uh, large uh, reserves in our sovereign wealth fund. Therefore, we can compensate this situation. But if the situation continues for longer, of course, it will be a big pressure on our budget. Knowing the production situation as we see it today, or the overproduction that we see in the market, Dan Jurgen, uh, is this price justified today? Because we saw the IEA report suggesting an overproduction of about 1.5 million barrels a day. Well, I, I think a founder, I think it was Royal Dutch Shell in about 1950, 15 was asked, uh, what's the right price of oil? And he says, it's whatever it fetches in the marketplace. And so if this is the marketplace is saying this, but there is an oversupply and the question of, of, of demand that's overhanging at the same time. So there's two things coming together. And as you suggested, this is an unusual situation because uh, the price of oil is walking arm in arm with the questions about the Chinese economy. Good. Let's uh, answer the big question, though, first, and I'll bring in Halid al as well. What are you banking on as an average price for 2016, knowing the dislocation we're seeing in the first three weeks of 2016 well, here I, at Davos? I don't think I would give an average price right now, so. Okay, do we have prices but, uh, go lower? Well, no, I think we're in a state, it's interesting now that if you look at both the oil price and you look at all commodity prices, when we look at our indices, they're all back to where they were in December 2003 before the super cycle began in commodities. Indeed, if you think about it, some people here will remember the OPEC price band of 22 to $28 a barrel. That's kind of where we are right now. Halid al you have to plan for Saudi Aramco, needless to say, uh, in addition to other plans you have for the group. What plans do you have for pricing going forward? It's a big question mark that people are wondering how Saudi Arabia plans with the strategy that they implemented. Well, Saudi Aramco as the company and Saudi Arabia as the nation, we have uh, the most resilient uh, <coughs> capacity within producers to take whatever the market serves us. If prices continue to be low, we will be able to withstand it for a long, long time. Obviously, we don't hope for that, but we're uh, prepared for it. We have the lowest cost production uh, in the planet by uh, a big margin from our next uh, competitors. Uh, and our investment uh, program is well financed internally, so we're able to continue to maintain and even grow capacity in oil and gas without having to borrow. Saudi Aramco essentially has zero debt on its balance sheet. The price itself is irrational, if you ask me, because uh, prices are supposed to be set by the marginal barrel. The marginal barrel is certainly way higher than $30 a barrel. But in the short, short term, while there is excess capacity, prices are set by variable costs. And most producers are able to pay the cash cost within the current price. So if the market continues to drive prices down, you will see some producers exiting uh, simply on the not being able to finance their short-term operating costs. We don't hope for that. I think the market will need all producers in the long term. There is growth coming up, a million barrels or so at least, year on year, and uh, that, of course, in addition to the decline of conventional and unconventional production that will take place. So in the short term, it's a very bleak picture with the overcapacity that you mentioned, but in the long term, I think we need current producers and we need to invest in new capacity to be able to meet demand. What do you, would you suggest as an average price for 2016, knowing the dislocation we see today, sir? I would not uh, risk my reputation or for <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and give a price. I do feel, though, that we are, we, we are, the market has overshot on the, on, on, on the low side and that it's inevitable to start turning up. Uh, where will we be uh, by year end? I don't know, but certainly I would bet it's going to be uh, higher than where we are today. Yes, yeah, so John, you have to divide that year in half, the first half in the second half, first half lower, second half somewhat higher. Okay, very good. Let's go to Russia and uh, Kirill Dmitriev, and then I'm gonna bring our other two guests in. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening comments, uh, Russia has taken a very distinctive view here, try to produce as much as possible. 
nearly 11 million barrels a day in December. Uh, you're fighting for market share as a country. I know you run the sovereign fund here. What is the strategy to go all out to get what you can in this sort of price climate? Well, first of all, I think we are not the only ones. Uh, obviously, other players are going very much for the market share. And when lots of people go for market share, you have decline in the price, which uh, we are seeing. But the good news is that the world still needs energy. You know, 80% of energy needs are fossil fuels. So we believe that, uh, obviously, oil prices will stay low for some time. Uh, and there is a trend that the growth of the economy requires half as much energy as 10 years before. So there is a long-term trend to have fewer uh, part of growth require more energy. But we also are cognizant of the fact that $400 billion of projects were delayed in CapEx. And people are really not investing as much as they were before. So we believe that next year, um, oil price should be more stable. And a prediction, you're asking for prediction, is 57.95 a barrel. And that's a consensus <laughs> of 31 analysts asked by Reuters, not my <laughs> prediction. <laughs> Is that the that's not the Russian For uh, next prediction? year, not for this year, for next year. For next price. year, I was going to say. That's quite a bet from 28 to 57.95. <laughs> I wouldn't take that bet, by the way, at this stage. Uh, we, a couple of question marks that we uh, raised here. Uh, Professor Lin, it would be good to get your thoughts uh, about demand in China. Nobody seems to believe the growth scenarios that we see in China today and whether realistically China's holding above 6% or not. And where's this demand coming from crude? I suggested it was 7.4 million barrels in the month of December being imported on a daily basis. Right, I think that the import is still very strong on the oil side. Uh, but the demand is a bit weak. I think there's some are going to the strategic reserve. Uh, but the, what made China so interesting, I think two reasons. One, China is big, right? That's everybody knows that. The other one is dynamic. Uh, it, it come up very quickly and also go down very quickly. So, and that created a huge impact on the international markets. I think that what China's impact at this point is not on oil side. Because uh, we, the demand in the oil, as I said, together with imports is still very strong at this moment. Um, uh, what is important, what is the problem is on others. We typically count for roughly 50% of the cement, steel, coal uh, production in, in, the, in, in the world. Uh, the demand is, is, is a peak at about 2011. 2012, that's down. 2013 is very good. But suddenly, on 2014, it's almost not there. This year is across the board negative. It has usually demand is roughly 0.5%. That's why some people are questioning mm. why the GDP and the energy is such a wide gap. I'm not defending the, which number is correct, but the, such a wide gap is possible in China. The reason for that is uh, the energy are so concentrated on the industry, particularly heavy industry. Heavy industry consume typically more than 60% of the energy in China. And those guys are very sensitive to economy. Mm. When economy not good, and they come down a little bit, the huge impact on the energy incremental in China. Mm. So that kind of gap is possible. In fact, if you look at US history, there's also some gap there. It's quite large between the GDP and energy. Uh, so the, the, having said that, I think that the China's demand uh, will come back. This is a very difficult time for transition. But China is still in the, in the process of industrialization. Well, it's no point to compare New York with Beijing. What needs to be compared is, uh, for example, a town in China compared with a town in Europe or in US or in Japan. So in that sense, the infrastructure development is still enormous. The need is still enormous. So when China's demand comes back, I think that uh, everybody looks better because of we, the, the size of the, of the demand and also the size of the economy. Good. But what are you projecting for growth, GDP growth for China uh, going forward? Because nobody really seemed to believe this number of 6.8%, <laughs> 6.9%. Uh, even though it was the slowest in 25 years? Well, uh, the Chinese government tried to uh, double the income uh, by 2020. That's between 2010 and 2020. If that is the case, they have to maintain 6.5% growth uh, for, the, for China uh, in the next five years. And that's in the five years plan. And that's realistically doable is what you're suggesting? Well, I, if, the, if the transition comes shorter, that's, that's realistic. That can be done. Okay, and let's bring in uh, the Minister of State for Petroleum from Nigeria. Uh, we had a chance to see each other uh, in the UAE recently, 
and, and you had mentioned some of the pain that this low oil price is causing. Well, how much dislocation is it causing in Nigeria uh, when your break-even cost for production is about $30, $31 a barrel? Give us a sense how you see the, uh, the pain applied to Nigeria at this stage. Well, first, there are two, two areas of production. The, the low sh and shallow water productions are less than $13 a barrel. So obviously, the uh, reason will demand that you begin to emphasize growth in those areas as opposed to growth in the, in the deep offshore. Deep offshore is where you have the 34 35 36 type dollar per barrel. A lot of dislocation, I think, similar to every other producing country, because even the wealthiest are suffering some dislocation from this also. Uh, but probably more intensely, you would expect a typical country, obviously, to have um, loss of its oil income over the years uh, represented either in infrastructure or in reserves. Uh, we don't we have a bit of reserves, but we, we don't have as much as we should. Uh, infrastructure hasn't been very well developed, so this does hit us quite hard. But having said that, what has happened, we've also come to find out that the Nigerian economy itself is, is a bit more resilient than we think. Um, we're emphasizing on areas of diversification, um, collection of uh, income locally, taxes. Uh, only about 20 25% of uh, Nigerians currently on the tax payroll, so we're, we're, we're doing a lot of work in that area. Um, and then we're beginning to look at what this is doing for us, is beginning to look, at least in the oil sector, in terms of cost. Mm. What is the cost of production? How can we do something better? And there's a collaborative effort between us and the oil companies who are working there to see how, we, how can we begin to review uh, projects, review production, and see how we can get that done. Funding has been a problem. How do we address funding through alternative uh, sources of finance? So. Bad news, but definitely opportunities on the upward side in terms of what you can do in the short-term period. But we're amongst those who are very optimistic that 2016 will end ultimately with better price for oil. Okay, you think it's going to be a better price? What drives that a better price? Is this the washout in the U.S. shale well, uh, production, well, or the higher cost projects being canceled as uh, Kareel was suggesting? Definitely U.S. shale uh, is key, uh, and if you look at the numbers that are coming up there, um, you look at a place like Texas, for example and what impact this is having, you begin to see that there's a lot of drop off in terms of production there. Um, <coughs> different from that, there's a natural decline anyway in production. If you do not invest to replace, to replace oil, you're gonna have a natural decline, usually about three million barrels uh, per day on the average. Um, with the sort of investment uh, approach you have right now, that is not being replaced. So you add that to the shale environment and you add that to those who are in any ways, in any, the natural attrition that is gonna happen in the marketplace you're going to see quite a lot of barriers leave if things continue at this, at this end. One group that hasn't been mentioned are indeed the oil producers. At the end of the day, there must be a bottom line point at which production no longer makes sense for them. And I'm sure they're also going to be sitting together to say, what are we going to do about this? Um, uh, for some, you can survive at $20. For some, you can survive at 10 But very many are going to start dropping off, off the ball very, very rapidly. And at that point, I think that's going to be the uh, alarm and clarion call. Well, in fact, there was a bit of an alarm bell last week when we saw the Wood McKenzie report suggesting nearly $400 billion of projects between 2016 to, to 2020, some 68 mainly deep water projects getting uh, canceled. The that whole, was the whole number, our, our number for the all upstream projects is $1.8 trillion lower than would have been expected. $1.8 trillion. trillion. Okay. Over what period of time? 2015 now? to 2020. 2015 to 2020. Compared to what was expected in 2014. Okay. So it's about a 40% fall in what had been expected. Okay, so this is gonna boomerang on this market where we're seeing a really deep correction leading to a boomerang right back up again in two to three years. Go ahead, Professor. Or Dan, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, I, I think that, I mean, this is, we have to remember these markets move in cycles, whether it's a really big boomerang or not will depend upon other forces, but you know, it's, it's postpone, delay, cancel. And uh, as uh, already said, you have an invent, you know, you need to replace your inventory. Okay. This would suggest that the Saudi Arabian strategy that was introduced in November 2014 by the Ministry of uh, Petroleum in Saudi Arabia is going to pay off. It's a fairly, fairly painful transition, but is this going to work in time to Saudi Arabia's favor? Well, you mentioned in the beginning that Saudi Arabia changed its strategy, and I would take exception with this. Saudi Arabia really has never advocated that it would take the role of balancing the market against a structural long-term uh, imbalance situation that was emerging the last two years. We have played the, the role of sort of the reserve bank of the global oil market stepping in when they were short-term events, the equivalent of the big financial crisis a few years ago, 
or the Asian financial crisis in the 90s, disruptions because of natural events or civil strife in one producer or another, we've always stepped in. What was happening the last few years is a structural divergence between supply and demand. We were starting to see reduced demand, a million barrels or so, and there were a host of other producers. Each one of them was aiming to produce a million barrels mm. a year, and that was just not going to be uh, sustainable. If Saudi Arabia was uh, to assume a role of balancing the market under that condition, we would literally be producing zero today, starting three or four years ago, because uh, the expensive oil would have continued to grow at more than a million barrels, plus other production coming on. So it was inevitable to let the market itself balance uh, supply and demand, and that's what we uh, simply allowed to do, which is the marketplace doing its thing. If you look at the pain measured by dollars in terms of how many barrels are exported into the marketplace, Saudi Arabia has experienced the, uh, the highest degree of pain in terms of uh, financial uh, penalties. But on the other hand, we have the highest number of reserves, 20% of the global reserves. And it's in our interest that the long-term value of our resources maintain their position in the marketplace. So balancing short-term with long-term is what the Saudi Arabian strategy has been all about. Uh, uh, you know, decades uh, ago, we will continue to do it. If there are short-term uh, adjustments that need to be made, and if other producers are willing to collaborate, Saudi Arabia will be also uh, willing to collaborate. But Saudi Arabia will not accept the role of, by itself, balancing a structural imbalance that is happening today. Okay, you're raising a very excellent point. I'm reading between the lines here. Uh, collaboration and cooperation. Uh, we've seen conversations take place before the OPEC meetings in Vienna with Russia attending, some other Central Asian players, Mexico participating. Isn't it high time that you see the fabled OPEC, non-OPEC cooperation take place? It's almost like you're welcoming other collaboration. Well, I, I mean, looking at the equity markets today, even in Asia, which is a net importing region, everybody is concerned about un reasonably low prices, which we are experiencing today. So it's not a matter of producers wanting to realize higher revenue. We need a stable price so that you can invest the kind of investments you need to replace natural decline. We produce one of nine barrels that are produced uh, around the world today. And we cannot accept a higher share of balancing supply than our pro rata ratio. So other other producers would have to come forward and offer to themselves contribute to balancing the market. And Saudi Arabia, as usual, will be interested in bringing prices and supply and demand imbalance to a level that meets the interests of producers and, uh, and, and, and consumers. Who's going to blink first here? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we're, it's not a matter of blinking. I think it's a matter of what is in the interest of all. And Saudi Arabia has the most uh, to gain by a stable market, and we will continue to advocate that. OK, it's a good time to bring in the Minister of State from Nigeria. Uh, you bluntly said when you were in Abu Dhabi, it's time for a, uh, an emergency meeting, and you're not alone anymore. There's uh, three other producers within OPEC, within OPEC itself, suggesting that it's time for an emergency meeting. Uh, do you think there's going to be a rallying call to actually not just call a meeting, but to take some production uh, from the market, from OPEC, to send a signal to other non-OPEC producers? Well, well, I think what is important is if you look at the trend, that there are certain areas in which we all agree. One is that the price today is not the right price and, and shouldn't continue for too long. Two, um, hopefully that in 2016, some level of um, not worse movement on pricing will occur. How much by how much, nobody's really setting, and nobody's ready to take a bet on that. Three, that uh, OPEC members by themselves will not bring uh, the needed change in the market unless there's a cooperation with non-OPEC members. I think on that, we're largely agreed, irrespective of the divide. Where you have disagreement is uh, Saudi Arabia's position, obviously, that, look, we, shouldn't, we should just let market forces dictate the, the, the direction. 
And the other mem OPEP members believe that, that there's a need for us to come back and traditionally do what we're known to do all the time, which is uh, try and give a leap to the market. The difficulty, of course, is that at 35% production levels, which is what OPEC holds, uh, even if you pull out everything that we have, you may not necessarily cause a, a major, a major uh, change in the market, especially when others continue to produce. But, but I think what is important is, is, is to continue to emphasize the fact that this is not the right price of oil. At this price, uh, there's going to be so much lack of production that very soon, it's going to be a cyclical thing. So we suffer right now, but ultimately uh, the consumers will suffer because then the production is so down, the prices shoot up right back again to 100 and something. So you're going on a topsy, 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 topsy movement. So I think what needs to happen is that uh, uh, two blocks need to talk. Uh, the non-OPEC members and the OPEC members need to talk uh, and look at what is the future here. Uh, what are we trying to accomplish? Uh, what has been the difficulty is that everybody's going on their own tangents uh, without anybody talking to one another. Uh, and, and I think that is probably where OPEC comes in. OPEC, I have said uh, personally, uh, and Nigeria believes that OPEC needs to meet, whether you call it an emergency meeting or the June already scheduled meeting, but there's a lot of energy around trying to meet earlier than that. Uh, obviously, some of that is a panic reaction, uh, but ultimately OPEC needs to sit there and say, Going forward, what, what's really going to be our role? Do we just sit back and watch? Do we put more effort in talking to uh, countries like Russia to try and get some consensus of what we need to be doing? It is the interest of both parties, uh, and I think that conversation hopefully will take place soon. Good. If you don't have an emergency at $28 a barrel, when do you have an emergency? <laughs> well, well I, I also don't think you, you should have a meeting just to react to emergency. I, I think you should have a, a meeting to react to the impact on the world oil outlook globally. It is not an issue of we need to go shape up the price a little bit because if you do anything too artificial, it's going to come cracking down very soon. So, but we need to sit down and say, as OPEC, what's our future? Um, what's the future of our reserve? There are countries like us who believe that rather than continue to produce at, at volumes uh, and at numbers that don't make any sense, we'd rather leave it for the next generation to deal with. And there are lots of that emotion with no OPEC members. So I, I think looking at the global outlook for oil is what is key. It's not so much addressing immediate price reactions. And I think that's where I am calling for a meeting, because I think we need to have that conversation earlier than June. Uh, but if we don't have it before June, that's fine. Uh, but we're talking to each other informally. Over the last uh, two, three weeks, I think I've talked to a lot of OPEC ministers. There's a lot of concern about this. Even Saudi Arabia itself has its own concerns about this. But it's just an issue of approach. Uh, and I think what we need to do is to get everybody more comfortable. Uh, and that's probably going to be the job of uh, the new OPEC president, Qatar to try and get everybody more comfortable to want to talk about this. Uh, you know. Okay, very good. It, it, I have want to come to the president of Azerbaijan and then to Russia next, but is OPEC dead? Has it just lost its clout in the market? What's the role of OPEC today uh, if you're not convening a meeting to see what all members, all 13 members are looking for? Uh, Khaled al Fale and then the Minister of State from Nigeria, please. Well, we have a Minister of Petroleum who is unfortunately not with us today, Mr. Ali Naimi. He would be better qualified to answer this question. But what I would say is that OPEC as a coordinating agency, not only by its, amongst its members, but also uh, with uh, non-OPEC uh, members, is a, a very useful uh, organization. And I think the recent episode of the downturn in the oil market has proven that OPEC's traditional role of balancing the market and looking after the interest of its members as well as the interest of the global community is a very important role. Obviously, the organization can be strengthened. The level of trust of the global community and the consumers in OPEC needs to be uh, increased and better cooperation amongst its members and with non-OPEC producers uh, would contribute to improving its effectiveness, but I wouldn't say it's dead. Uh, the Minister of State, I, I find it interesting. I, I, Nine of 13 almost walked out of the meeting in December because they were so frustrated by a block that wants to continue to flood the market with oil. Let's be candid. I, I wouldn't quite put it that way. Nobody really threatened to walk out. There were very, very, very fervent opinions on issues. And, and as OPEC president, I managed to bring all that together. Because really, at the end of the day, everybody wants something that is good for OPEC. I, I think that's where agreed. In terms of the future of OPEC, no, I don't think it's dead. The mere fact that everybody continues to look for OPEC members to, to indicate what their position is on this issue shows you how strong they really are. Uh, this is probably the first time they're not really uh, getting out to intervene, and that is causing this whole tumult. So that, that shows you that they still, have the, they still have the firepower. 
Because in reality, they're probably the only unified group that tends to want to talk as, as, as a group. Uh, other producers talk individually. But I think what has come up, obviously, is that uh, the time has now passed for everybody to see OPEC as, as a deciding factor in terms of price fixing. Uh, we, we will need to work collaboratively with others, and there's got to be a sharing of common goals. And I think that's what this has brought out. OK, Dan Jurgen. then I'm going to go to the president of Azerbaijan. So first of all, John, uh, if you look back historically, periodically, obituaries are written for OPEC. And yep. then they get uh, retracted and then they come out again. But I think, in a sense, this leg down on price is not surprising. People knew Iran was going to come back into the market. Iran came back into the market sooner than was expected because the nuclear agreement was accelerated for other reasons. And so it came in at a time of maximum weakness and seasonal weakness in the market anyway. So the price was going to go down. So there are two numbers to watch now in the next uh, you know, next two, three months. One is what are the volumes that Iran actually puts into the market between 300,000 and a million, where do they come out? And I think that's a big question mark on the market. And the other, of course, is what you said at the beginning. What happens to US production, which is down about half a million barrels a day? And what happens now in this environment between now and say, uh, the beginning of summer? Good. Uh, officials from the National Iranian Oil Company uh, said they've already tested a million barrels a day. And I'm not talking about the floating storage that they can sustain an increase of a million barrels a day by December 2016. Do you believe the figures, Daniel? Well, I, I don't have any way to independently uh, evaluate them. That's a high number. I think the consensus in the industry is that those numbers are quite high. You've seen other numbers that are much more like 300,000 barrels a day, and we'll see what decisions they make. They make money from putting more oil in the market. Price goes down, they lose money. They also have this other source of money, which is the escrowed money that comes out of the banks, which is actually a much larger number. OK, very good. Uh, the president of uh, Azerbaijan, uh, we've heard from two OPEC uh, <laughs> ministers here. One, no, sorry, minister of state and the chairman of Saudi Aramco. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm talking about your future job yet. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to be accused of that, because I live in the Middle East. Uh, that would be a big mistake. Sorry about that. Excuse me. Um, are you willing to cooperate? Well, uh, I mean, realistically, you're producing about 800,000 barrels a day, a non-OPEC member. Uh, have you ever reached out to OPEC and said, look, we need to, I'm suffering a lot in Azerbaijan. We need to do something about it. We are ready to do it. And actually, that was a part of our discussions with some of the OPEC members. We are not a big producer. But I think that uh, if uh, we have more coordination between OPEC members and large non-OPEC members with respect to the reduction of production, then maybe we can have result. Because unfortunately, after every OPEC meeting, the price of oil goes down. Therefore, we are very concerned about the possible new meeting, which <laughs> we are planning. <laughs> so maybe better not to have it. <laughs> and, um, but That's as, how much confidence you have in OPEC these days. <laughs> But this is and a, that's the rotating president who just <laughs> left his job. That doesn't say too much. <laughs> this is the real situation. Therefore, of course, I think But um, the coordination between large non-OPEC and OPEC agreeing to reduce price and uh, increase the level of mutual trust. Because if it doesn't happen, I think that OPEC itself would not make this decision. And without this decision, we'll have this situation and just wait when the oil price will reach its bottom. Every day we think this is a bottom, and then, <laughs> you know, we see a new price for oil. And uh, uh, frankly speaking, this is already a little bit exhausting, also from a psychological point of view, not to mention, you know, the countries <laughs> need to balance the budget, to have uh, funds for investment, and not only into oil and gas. And the difference between companies and countries is exactly this difference. We need to invest in social infrastructure. We need to invest in uh, industrial infrastructure. And at the same time, to maintain the level of production, we need to invest in oil and gas. So this situation, of course, is not very pleasant. But at the same time, for Azerbaijan, it is a good time for reforms. And we started fundamental reforms of our financial sector, economic reforms, uh, export-oriented non-oil economy production, and to forget about oil factor. As I said before, we were trying to prepare ourselves for this period, maybe in 15, 20, 25 years from now. But now we have to do it now. And I think that we'll cope with the situation. Again, economic situation in Azerbaijan is stable. 
our foreign debt is only 12% of, of GDP, and uh, our foreign currency reserves are almost the same level as our GDP. Therefore, I'm sure we will manage the crisis. But, of course, we want to have predictable future in order to plan our budget for the next year. Good. You've had a, about a 70% devaluation of your currency. Yeah. Uh, it's been a very painful process, and you even had some protests in Azerbaijan as well. So this is social dislocation with that sort of correction in the last year, all caused by a plummet in oil prices. Yeah, of course, there were several factors. First of all, of course, the decline of uh, oil price. And our national currency during the last 10 years gained weight against dollar, which was, I think, a little bit artificial. One manat was $1.3. dollars. Therefore, the first devaluation was to bring manat back to one to one. And the second devaluation was mainly because of uh, devaluation of national currencies in the neighborhood. And uh, our goods became not uh, competitive. And uh, it was additional burden on our budget. Therefore, it was uh, inevitable. We tried to resist as long as we could. We lost some funds of our um, national bank reserves. But we had to take this measure. There were, uh, of course, uh, some concerns about that because it immediately reflected in the rise of uh, consumer prices, which we import. And we're still uh, at some goods import uh, dependent country. Therefore, increase of the price created certain concern. It was a minor protest um, based on some you know, stress situation. People were not prepared for that. But now it's over. And uh, I think that economic development in Azerbaijan will be sustainable. We had the fastest growing economy in the world, I think one of the fastest. 300% growth in the last 10 years. So it was too, too much, I think. And now it's a time that the cycles go down. And with the current situation, with the currency reserves, I think we'll manage the situation. Good. You're not the Minister of Energy, uh, Kirill, but uh, I'm sure they didn't let you sit on the panel without some sort of guidance here. Is Russia willing to sit down and consider coming off record production of 10.8 million barrels? Well, I think this agreement is possible, but at the right time. And if we were to dissect what will drive this timing, I think we have to think about some of the thinking of the players. Because some players may believe that in 15, 20 years, there will not be much need for oil because of the electrical cars, etc. You know, 70% of oil consumption is transportation. 42% of that is uh, cars. Uh, so basically, some players may say, oh, in 20 years, less demand for oil, so let's go for market share in the meantime. But I don't believe this is what driving some of the dynamics here. I think some players want to, as one of the ministers of the country said, punish uh, shell oil producers. Uh, you know, other countries may want to prevent successful entry of new players to the market and make sure that they cannot strengthen themselves by you know, increasing oil production too much. Uh, so there is lots of this interplay of interest. Some countries may want to use this as an impetus for reforms and really drive this agenda to then have higher prices. So I believe uh, when those things play out, maybe within a year, you know, and countries get what they uh, want, then it's going to be much easier to sit down and agree. But for now, lots of players, lots of countries have different agendas, different interests, so it's difficult to agree right at this time. Hmm. What's the Russian agenda in this process then? Is it all about market share? Because that's what the production is suggesting right now. Well, uh, I think uh, we uh, believe that it's a good time uh, for transformation, but we definitely believe that the oil price is too low right now. And it's not reflective of fundamentals. So we are open to cooperation. We are open to uh, discussions. And I think uh, at, when the right time comes, those discussions will lead to a higher price. Good. What do you think about what you've been hearing so far, Mr. Rafali? Well, I think we're talking about uh, short-term uh, reactions to what's happening today. And of course, in an ideal situation, you would balance supply and demand and keep prices within a reasonable range. But I think the big challenge that is facing the industry uh, is long-term planning of capacity and having long-term investments match the expected uh, needs in terms of demand and replacing natural production. And neither OPEC and certainly not with uh, other non-OPEC producers, that has never taken place. And what was uh, apparent uh, two or three years ago 
is that there was a long-term trend to increase production massively, both from within OPEC and non-OPEC, especially with the technology and, and uh, business model that developed in North America, that supply was going to be just far above demand unless some uh, producers, big producers, voluntarily withdrew a lot, of, a lot of barrels. And as I mentioned earlier, that, that is not going to happen. So in addition to uh, discussing in an objective and rational way what is to be done in 2016 and 2017, there needs to be a, a mechanism where long-term supply increments are properly planned to meet the needs of the global economy. Discussions about renewables and, uh, are, are, I think, uh, taken out of context. I don't think renewables uh, or the pressures by climate change are going to significantly reduce beyond what has already taken place. The long-term demand on oil, so the last thing we, the global economy and community needs is to see the oil industry withdrawing from, from uh, because electric cars will take over. If electric cars were to take off, where is the electricity uh, coming from? And if it comes from coal, then climate change is going to be uh, impacted negatively by electrification of, uh, of the automobile. So I think we need to be pragmatic uh, and objective and, and planning uh, for the future and the producers have a collective role, OPEC and non-OPEC, to, to have a dialogue and, and, and to understand where demand is going to be and who's going to be produced. Obviously, low-cost producers will expect to have a significant part of the long-term supply. And we in Saudi Arabia have our own development needs, uh, but we also feel responsible to provide energy at a reasonable cost to consumers. So we're not going to accept to withdraw our production to make uh, space for others. That's a pretty pointed uh, a statement. I, would even, I could even apply that to Iran, which is trying to come back on the market, and they want to go back to 4.3 million barrels a day within an 18-month period. They kind of feel that's their deserved market share. I'm not going to comment on what the Iranians <laughs> are or are not planning to do. They can speak uh, for themselves. But uh, not only our significant low-cost reserves uh, that are already developed and ready to go, but the significant investments we have put in place. And I think our consumers uh, who have relied not only recently but over the last seven decades on Saudi production of energy, uh, fueling the global uh, economic development over most of the last century, want Saudi Arabia to be a significant part of uh, providing energy to the global community. And this is a position that we've earned over uh, a long time, and we've earned it by investing, by being uh, true to our principles, and by uh, continuing to be committed to our consumers, and we're not going to leave that position for others. Well, pretty clear message. Professor Lin, I think if you get your thoughts on uh, picking up on what uh, Mr. Afali talked about in terms of renewables, there's a lot of renewable investment still in China. And despite the fact that oil and gas investment dropped 15%, even as high as 20% in 2015, the rise <laughs> of renewable investment kind of driven by subsidies is still going higher. You're expecting that trend to continue in China? Yes, it will be. Uh, because the Chinese government can meet that, the 15% of clean energy by 2020. Right now, it's only 12%. And nuclear and hydro takes a longer time to build. So the wind and solar will continue to go. Uh, I believe there's a, there's a talk uh, by the government that uh, this year there'll be 20 gigawatt of wind power and most uh, 15 gigawatt of the solar, despite the, there's an overcapacity at this moment in the electricity sector. Uh, right now, the overall system of electricity roughly have 20% surplus at this moment. It's because the demand suddenly come down, and then the minimum or not, the capacity is still coming out. This year, we add another 60 gigawatt of, uh, of coal-fired power plant into the system. The decision was made, of course, four or five years ago. But I'm saying is that uh, the capacity is uh, huge. And given that capacity, there's substantial difficulty for the, for the solar and wind in reality even though the government is subsidizing, it's protecting it. The problem is you cannot, do not find enough demand for generation. 
So therefore, journalism I will keep declining. Of course, it's not as declining as much as Kofi problem. But still, given that already pretty low generation hours, for a decline is also making difficulty for the wind and solar industries. But anyway, the, 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 I think that another 100 gigawatt of wind, also possibly more than 60 gigawatt of the solar will come into picture in the next five years in China. Good. I saw President Xi go to Saudi Arabia, go to Egypt, go to Iran. Russia signed a long-term 30-year contract with China. Is there too much dependency on China's demand right now? It's like the most popular uh, player at the ball, the, the, the most popular woman at the ball. I mean, everybody's courting China's demand and long-term contracts. Is there a danger as China starts to slow down that there's an over-dependency that everybody's tilting east to China? Uh, on the oil side, I don't believe so because uh, the per capita is quite low at this moment. And in fact, I look at demand last year. The gasoline is okay, seven, more than 7% increase. The major problem comes from diesel, that's a related to industry. And that's what is consistent with what is the current situation right now. If the industrial production will coming back, and given that China still put in 20 million of the car on the street every year, the Chinese oil demand still there. And by the way, the Middle East is still our biggest uh, uh, exporter. Uh, more than 50% at this moment. Okay. Saudi coming down a little bit, but uh, because we buy more from Russia, but uh, still uh, 15% at this moment, I guess. Good John, it's not irrational. If you look at the period of the super cycle in commodities, 20, 2003 to 2013, 45% of all the growth in world demand was in one country called China. Hmm. But can it be sustained, Dan? That's well, that's the question over the market. And yep. that's what I'm saying that at the beginning that when China comes out very quickly and was going down very quickly, that has a huge impact on the international market. Mm. It does, Holly? Well, we're the biggest exporter of crude oil uh, to China. We also have investments in China, refining and marketing. And there is a silver lining to the China story in that as they shift to a consumer-led economy and as more of the Chinese people move into the middle class, and they start consuming more, uh, petroleum products tend uh, to gain. While heavy industry, cement and steel slows down, that's going to hurt more of the coal versus, uh, versus the oil. So I think light uh, oil uh, products will, will, will benefit from the shift that the Chinese economy is undertaking. Good, I wanted to follow up on the cash burn in uh, Saudi Arabia in 2015. It was about $110 billion. We saw the budget for 2016. This is a change of mentality for the Saudi people. Uh, lifting of petrol prices, subsidies coming off for power. It's a change of thought. Is Saudi society ready for this? Uh, after all, King Salman's been in power for just now, taking the throne uh, for just about a year, as you know. This is a major transition. Is it gonna remain stable with the cash burn and prices the way they are today? Absolutely. First of all, Saudi Arabia uh, has been planning to restructure its economy, to move to a smaller, more effective government, and to empower and unleash the private sector in a bigger way, diversify income with less dependence on oil. None of these happens overnight. There are transitions that take years uh, to, to happen. Sometimes they take decades. The current phase we're in with oil prices is going to give us the impetus to accelerate this. And we started. The budget of 2016 uh, is basically flat spending compared to uh, 2015. So we're not really slowing down the, the growth of the economy. Still, Saudi Arabia will grow in GDP in 2016. Uh, per per uh, all uh, predictions. You need to grow five or six percent to make sure your youth unemployment rate doesn't go up. Well, you know un that. unemployment can be can be helped by substituting. Uh, we have 10 million foreign workers uh, in Saudi Arabia. So with better training and development, and the private sector picking up more of the slack on providing jobs for Saudis. So there is a lot of reforms within the labor markets that can take place. There is a lot of localization of our own spending. And energy alone will create half a million jobs. And this is something that we are undertaking. The healthcare sector, which I am re responsible for, is basically all based on imported 
input factors from mm -hmm. pharmaceuticals to medical equipment to even healthcare workers. If we gradually uh, localize uh, these input factors, that will create not only a lot of jobs, but also a lot of GDP growth. So we have many levers at our disposal that the government with, uh, with the Economic and Development Council uh, being in the cockpit literally 24-7, uh, moving these levers, we will be able to uh, develop Saudi Arabian economy into a more diverse, more sustainable, less dependent on oil, with a lot of opportunities, not only for Saudi investors, but here in Davos, I think there are numerous opportunities. We're literally uh, opening the doors wide open for foreign direct investments, for, for investors who are willing to come and invest in Saudi Arabia and take advantage of the next phase of development, which is going to be significant. Mm, some are very concerned about the young uh, deputy crown prince, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, that he's moving too quickly as a youthful leader, too many reforms, too much shock therapy uh, for a place that used to have very gradual change. Uh, what can you share in terms of insights on that front? Well, uh, the same people were concerned that we were too slow <laughs> uh, in the past. And I think uh, as a former runner, I used to run, it helps to go through sprints uh, at times to, to develop your muscular strength. So indeed, we're, uh, we're accelerating our reform. His Royal Highness uh, is very ambitious in terms of where he wants Saudi Arabia to be sooner uh, rather than later. And I assure you that everybody who works with him and around him is excited by his vision and is uh, energized by his energy. Uh, and, and, and we see uh, opportunities uh, left, right and center that are waiting for us to grab. And, and uh, it's not going to be the government alone. It's the government, the private sector of Saudi Arabia. And it's the global community of people who want to partner with us. And, and uh, like I said, uh, take advantage in a positive way of these opportunities in a mutually beneficial uh, manner. To reform. Go ahead, Kareel. Yeah, actually, I would like to uh, agree with this because we had an opportunity to meet with the Crown Prince and we feel that this transformational path of Saudi Arabia is very exciting. Uh, and we as Russia would like to invest in some of the projects that we are discussing and the fact that they really want to build tourism around Mecca and other yeah. areas. So what we see is really a very interesting test case of can the recification away from oil happen very quickly given the energy of the economic team in Saudi Arabia that's moving very quickly and is doing lots of things right. Okay, very good. I'm gonna finish up here in, in two minutes, but uh, is anybody really surprised why we have such a bearish market today? Nobody can really point to why we see such a downfall in prices the way we see it today. Does it make sense with the supply and demand well, equation that we're seeing today? I'll let it follow. Well, I think, I think the era of high oil prices uh, is, is the reason we're, we're seeing this. We were surprised here in Davos and elsewhere and in Dan's uh, uh, conferences. I've always said the oil price was too high given the fundamentals when it was above $100. And that high price pulled a lot of money, a lot of investment. The oil industry uh, is a long cycle and there is a lag time between when the money comes in to where, when production comes out. So the production we're seeing coming to the market in 2015, 2014 is because of the decisions that were made mm. over the last decade because of high oil prices that were above the marginal cost of most uh, of, of the reserves around the world. And it's going to take some time of lower, more moderate oil prices to bring supply and demand in balance. Unfortunately, it takes time. Okay, Dan, your final thoughts on yeah. that? This is the fourth time in the last 80 years where you've had a sudden big surge of oil coming to the market and each time it happens, surprise, supply and demand, price goes down. I think what's happened, and I think your question in the short term, is every kind of piece of information adds not only to the supply demand balance, but to the negative sentiment in the market. And so one of the things to keep your eye out is when some things, some inputs come into the market, that are no longer negative, because everything now is just hammering down on the price. Well, it's pretty extraordinary. We had uh, tensions between Saudi Arabia and Iran in the last month, attacks against Libyan facilities by ISIS uh, hitting supplies. Uh, Syria doesn't go away, attack uh, in, in Iraq. I mean, numerous different things that would have shocked the market before 
Don't even move the needle on the upside. Well, I That's think, how bearish just well, market and is. And I think you, while there is a surplus of geopolitical risk, there's a greater surplus of oil. But we'll see what happens. You know, keep your eye on Iranian volumes. Keep your eye on U.S. volumes. That's just one suggestion of the sort of things that could change the psychology in the market. Okay. Uh, Mr. President, give you the final word here. Uh, how do you plan if you have a price at $28 a barrel? Do you think we've reached very close to the bottom and we can turn back in the next quarter or not? Yeah, I think so. I think that we're very close, maybe $2, $3 uh, more to drop. And then in the second half of the year, the market will grow because we all know that it is a cyclic, you know, system. And there was a time, I remember, when we launched our major oil development project in 1994, the price was $12. And it seemed to be very normal. And when we were planning the development, I remember we, we thought about optimistic scenario, which was $22. So now we are very close to that optimistic <laughs> scenario 20 years ago. So I hope that the market will stabilize because uh, oil sector needs investment. And uh, last year, we had uh, the highest percentage of drop of investments in the oil sector. So without that, definitely the price will go up and uh, will stabilize, I hope. Uh, I, I also don't want to give any prognosis, but I think for companies, for investors, for governments, $60, $70 per barrel will be excellent price. And I hope to see that sooner than later. But by 2017, you think? I think so, yeah, I think so, 2017. This year, or the second half of the year, I think will be the uh, period of stabilization and hopefully uh, we can see the growth. Okay. Uh, nice round of applause for the panel. I really appreciate all your input today. Thanks.